we're hearing more and more about some of the little cancers, but the big ones are still they're the uh, uh, can I say they're the killers? What is your experience in in clinical practice? That's a, that's a that's a very important question, Jody. And um, you know, I the word cancer itself um, puts is is the the scariest of words to hear in reference to yourself because people almost have an immediate recoil of oh no, not me, I'm going to die, and so many cancers are, are not lethal, they're highly curable. And if they're not curable, then especially when people begin to approach their own wellness and secondary prevention aspects, I find that even if they're not cured of their cancer, they can live with it a really long time. Sometimes they get to die of something else. Sometimes it's the cancer that eventually does them in, but meanwhile, they can have a lot of good time to enjoy family and friends and sunsets and this amazing world that we have. So I think it's important just to, to focus our efforts on, you know, the, the most common cancers and why do they arise? And because many, you know, if, if you know, it's not that a, a rare cancer is not important, but many of the same things, if we are able to do some generalizations, many of the same things you'll see overlapping between different tumor streams. And we'll realize that all of these tumors, if we lump them together, they have something in common. They're the, the, the ones that you've, you've asked about, primarily the lung, colorectal, breast, prostate, skin, they're all epithelioid malignancies. They have certain cell markers that are retained that tell us when we look at the cancer cell under the microscope or on flow cytometry or cytogenetics, we, we can know that that cell came from an epithelial derivative. And it just depends on how far we look back in its, in its genealogy, so to speak, and it's in its family tree. And, and they come and under so the carcinoma group. Those are all carcinomas. The sarcomas are fairly rare. They come from a mesodermal epith um, it, um, embryonic derivative, the mesenchymal cells. And those tend to be, um, they don't go through mitosis as often, but when they do go through mitosis, it's fast, furious, and hard to stop. Because when we are in our mother's womb, we, we start out as a, a, as a little blastocyst and it's the cells that are connected to the uterus that eventually form the fetus there. And so many of these things happen just without even, you know, everything is happening without the mother even knowing that something has attached to her womb and it's actually growing like a cancer there. And a, about a trillion cells per week are synthesized in that space. And we actually have something that resembles a human after about 10 weeks. So all of those cells that started with that one cell going through mitosis trillions of times in a very short time span, you could imagine that as one cell passes the baton to the next generation and that becomes more specialized, more specialized, more specialized, organs are formed. And, but it all started with the one. And so what I've begun to, to understand about cancer is that, and, and it's been understood for a long time, this is, not, this is not my unique understanding, the more primitive of the cells have the greatest potential for spreading. And they're also, they, they like to go through mitosis under certain conditions. Mitosis is one cell becoming two. That's the, the cell division process, as you would know. Um, so they're, they're kind of slowed down when certain factors that are present during pregnancy are not present. Um, we know during that time, there's really not much circulation apart from what's being parasitized from the mother and what's floating in that area with, without oxygen and you know just whatever little amount of glucose can be achieved. So this is the condition that favors cancer. We often think that you know starving cancer is going to be the way to go. Well, that 
you know, you can't really starve cancer without starving yourself in some capacity. The key is to be selective with your nutrition because the cancer really is quite limited. And when we go back to those very primitive embryonic cells, they, they can only, ex they're only there because there's no oxygen. Once oxygen starts infusing the tissues, things get more and more specialized to deal with our oxygen laden environment. And, but the more primitive cells, they actually get meaner. The more oxygen is taken away, the more anaerobic things become. It, it just causes sort of the amplification of primitive genes. And this is why, in my view, um, oxygen therapies might have a role to play because they actually promote autophagy in the primitive cell type. And so it's not necessarily, you know, a, the killing so much as it is the differentiation and the autophagy happening as a result of cell differentiation and the cells moving forward to a more specialized and normalized type as opposed to the primitive form. So an autoph autophagy is cell death. Yeah, programmed cell death. And that's what people need to realize as well, because every single cancer cell has its own programmable cell death pathway. And most of that is around a, a molecule called P53. P53 is, you know, part of the oxidative burst phase of, of, of cell killing. And, and, and almost every cancer has a mutated P53. So when we can get P53 signaling pathways working, um, the, the cancer cell can just go kill itself. That's its natural biologically programmed response. We don't have to do anything. And, and it's just a matter of helping the other cells around the cancer cell understand they have a role in the structural integrity of the, the individual. And then the cancer cell gets to actually caring what's happening around it. And that happens when our vitamin D levels are good through a molecule called e -cadherin. We must have e -cadherin in order to have all of our cells function. And when you are low in vitamin D, which is central to that e -cadherin pathway, nothing works like it should. And so these are all very simple hacks that, that send very powerful messages regarding cell coherence, cell signaling pathways, and the cost is, is relatively small and, and, and not very toxic in the end. And so I found that it's, it's really quite powerful just to get my patients on a healthy vitamin D level and also making sure their methylation pathways are working and they're not adding to the toxic burden or the, um, the, the basically the processed foods and inflammatory um, things in our diet that we know, and these are well described, but largely ignored by the medical profession. Yep. So these um, very common cancers are almost always epithelial cancers. They're almost always adenocarcinomas. There are a few squamous cell carcinomas in there, also epithelial derived. The adenocarcinomas generally are from the um, subcutaneous glands or sub-epithelial glands in the colon or the ductal cells of the breast, the ductal cells of the prostate, and so on. So on. those are the, the two big, um, big family trees, and the rest of them are, are, are somewhat more rare, more unusual. And the um, lymphoid and blood-forming elements, um, those come from a different lineage as well. And can you talk a little bit about metastatic processes? And here's a simple question. Can a carcinoma turn into a blood cancer? Not usually. Um, there, there are things called carcinosarcomas and things that can have multi-lineages. You can have a, a biphenotypic B and T cell lymphoma. And that generally means that they've heralded from a more primitive um, origin um, in order to have two mutated 
pathways of, of differentiation being manifested in the same tumor. They're, they're a, a bit of a chimera, as it were, yeah. um, for lack of a better term. Um, so, but carcinomas don't usually form blood cancers. Um, sometimes we get secondary malignancies from cancer treatment. Some secondary leukemias can arise from alkyl alkylating agents and topoisomerase inhibitors and various things that can cause a small incidence of secondary leukemias after treatment of epithelial carcinomas. Oh, and surgery? Surgery is very interesting. Um, you know, I... I think we, we don't realize that many normal looking people are walking around with cancer. And by the time most oncologists see a cancer patient, they've probably been growing a cancer for at least two years, if not five years. And we know that the time it takes from a, a pre-malignant polyp in the colon to the time someone develops a colon cancer from that polyp is about 15 years. So there's a lot of opportunity for early detection and early detection is key for surgery. Um, the problem is that at any point in the life cycle of the malignant cell, it can become dis disengaged from the primary tumor and it can go into the lymphatic circulation, the blood circulation, and, and it can basically spread anywhere. We know that, you know, this was a really mean study and I, I hated the whole idea of it. It was done probably 20 years ago, but on um, a series of breast cancer patients that had stage one, um, they did double bone marrow biopsies on these patients, which would have been, I would have struggled to get that through an ethics board but they did polymerase chain reaction on those bone marrow samples and found that 40% of stage one breast cancer patients actually had breast cancer DNA in their bone marrow. So if that was used as a criteria for metastasis, we would, we would have been treating those very early stage women as having stage four disease. But we know that 40% of them were not going to manifest their disease. So that tells you that even though these little things might be frequently migrating and settling in various places, they don't often become a cancer. We know that stage one breast cancer has less than a 10% likelihood of developing metastatic disease or manifesting that. So these little cells can go places and travel. They don't always become cancer. So I think the biggest research question in my mind that's not being addressed is what was the cancer cell doing before it decided to start growing again? And, and that's the space where I like to put forth non-toxic, relatively inexpensive modalities that we know are going to shut down the injury signals, nourish the body. And so that, that's, that's really the important space if we can actually get people doing these things and realizing what a powerful place this is. Because if, if we don't keep stimulating the process, that led to the cancer phenotype, we don't necessarily have the manifestation of a metastatic process. Yep. So it comes back to the, to, to, I guess, to, we can even talk, call it terrain theory. Yeah, it's, it's um, terrain. It, it's, it's, it's host factors as well as the biological um, aggressiveness of the cancer and its, its own intrinsic potential. And, and is it still responding to its own P53 signals? Or is it getting signals that are encouraging it to go through mitosis and and begin, you know, invading the tissue that, that it's surrounding? Yeah. Or, that, or that's surrounding it. Yeah. So basically we could say that cancer kills by growing into key organs, nerves and blood vessels and interfering with or impairing their function. That would at base be correct. Yeah, I, th I think that's one aspect of it. I would go just a little bit further because the cancer cell is a cell that's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, it doesn't belong there. And it's, it's a klutzy cell. It's not intelligent. It's not Darth Vader. It's, it's basically a little bull in a china shop. 
and it doesn't really know what it's doing. It's, it's, it's a baby throwing a tanty in the supermarket. It causes everything around it to get upset and it causes inflammation. So one of the more common and, and preventable things that causes death in cancer patients is blood clotting. Um, so patients often die of secondary blood clots. Um, the, if someone lives long enough with their cancer, if the cancer is uncontrolled, and the cancer doesn't invade a major organ that you know causes a life-threatening emergency the the pathway then becomes one of starvation because the cancer is so demanding with its calories and it absorbs calories especially glucose calories faster than any other tissue in the body and so the other tissues just begin to starve. And this is the, the mechanism of cancer cachexia. And so this is where strategic nutrition comes in again, because we know that cancer cannot live on ketones, whereas most of the body's normal tissues have been programmed to live on ketones. We've had to, we, as a species, we've had implied fasting for sometimes days and weeks at a time before we were able to emerge from our cave or catch a beast and go hunting and gathering our food again. So intervals of fasting and starvation are hardwired into our DNA. Um, our caveman ancestors didn't eat three square meals a day, and that's probably not really that good for us at the end of the day when, when we explore these things a bit further.